I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 34 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Payne proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 14 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note four senators are standing. A uh, five. Uh, sorry, Senator Scar, you were behind Senator Dunningham. I understand that the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. And can I thank uh, my good, good friend, Senator Payne, who I've known a long, long time, uh, for proposing this MPI. And the need for the government—this is what the matter of public importance is—the need for the government to adopt a plan to ease pressure on cost of living for Australian families and small businesses now, not in October but to actually address the issue now, because we know, Mr Deputy President, that Australians are facing those cost of living pressures today. And we know that because the economic statement released last week and also the most recent inflation figures. Australia now has, for the year ending 30 June 2020-2022, an annual inflation rate CPI of 6.1%. 6.1 per cent. This is the largest CPI rate since uh, Australia, the Australian government introduced the uh, goods and services tax. 6.1 per cent. And even if you take out, even if you take out some of the outliers in terms of the inflationary pressures and trim it down, the trimmed mean inflation, the trimmed mean inflation rate is at 4.9 per cent. So even if you take down the, the factors which are pulling that inflation rate up to 6.1 per cent and maybe on the other side pulling it down, so you take the trim mean inflation rate, it's at 4.9 per cent. 4.9 per cent. And that's the highest, that's the highest level since that particular measurement was actually used uh, from 2003. So the highest level, the highest level in nearly 20 years. And the forecasts are even more grim. The forecasts are even more grim. By the end of the year, by the end of the year, Treasury forecast is that Australia will be facing an inflation rate of 7.75 per cent. 7.75 per cent. That's the forecast for the end of the year. So Australia is crying out, is crying out for a government that actually has a positive plan that will actually counter these inflationary pressures. And we simply do not have it. We simply don't have it. Mr Deputy President. In fact, we have the contrary. We have the contrary. Just, just at a point in time when Australia is facing these inflationary cost pressures, what is the obsession of those opposite? The obsession of those opposite is with the Australian Building and Construction Commission, abolishing the powers, gutting the powers of the ABCC, and then ultimately seeking to, when they take the time to actually present legislation to this place, to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And that will actually feed in. That will actually feed into inflation. And you don't need to believe me for that. You don't need to believe me. You can look at an independent report that was put out by Ernst & Young. Because the ABCC is the cop on the beat at our construction sites around Australia. They're the cop on the beat at our construction sites around Australia. And the work they do is incredibly important in terms of keeping those construction costs down for our schools, for our roads, for our hospitals, for our important social infrastructure. And the result, the result of abolishing the ABCC will be to increase those construction costs. And I quote, from a study released by Ernst & Young in relation to their economy-wide modelling in relation to the impact of abolishing the ABCC. And I quote, key economic costs indicated by the modelling involve output in the construction industry could fall by around $35.4 billion by 2030 as higher cost inflation makes fewer projects possible and capital is reallocated to other economic activities. Why would you introduce that sort of policy in a high inflation environment? What is the sense of it? 
What is the sense of it, apart from providing a SOP to the CFMEU? There's no sense to it in this environment. It's entirely the wrong thing to do if you want to take those cost pressures off the Australian economy. Ernst & Young says, overall economic activity as a result of Labor's policy could decline by $47.5 billion by 2030. 47.5 billion as high costs and lower productivity act as a handbrake on other sectors. So those costs that will increase through the construction industry as a result of the Labor government's policy to abolish the ABCC, they are going to infect all sorts of sectors across the whole of the Australian economy. And it goes on. It goes on. If the ABCC were abolished, and that is what the Australian government's, the current government's, Albanese's government's intention is, this could lead to a total economic loss of around $47.5 billion compared to baseline estimates to 2030. Employment and labour cost impacts. Ernst and Young go on. The construction industry is one of the largest employers in Australia, employing almost 1.15 million people. The industry also directly supports jobs in other Australian industries, such as timber, steel and cement manufacturing. Modelling suggests that abolishing the ABCC could cost, again cost, the Australian economy up to 4,000 jobs. Job losses are felt immediately as output in the construction industry falls and labour costs rise. And then there's the fiscal cost. There's the fiscal cost. When every school, every hospital, every road project is going to cost 30 per cent, estimated 30 per cent more because of the lawless behaviour of the construction division of the CFMEU, whose representatives sit around the Labor Party's national executive. And as a result of those costs. Senator Erke, point of order. I know that the, um, the MPI specifically talks about electricity prices. I haven't heard one mention of any electricity. I've heard a beat up on unions, I've heard a beat up on the CFMEU, I've heard him talk about the ABCC, but there has not been one mention. to what the MPI is actually based on and ask him to point his remarks to that point. Senator Scar. Wish to make a submission? Uh, uh, well, I'm happy to talk about electricity costs. Absolutely happy to talk about electricity costs. I didn't see, Mr. Deputy President, the $275 supposed supposed saving, which is going to flow through, which is going to flow through to electricity users across Australia, that was promised by the Labor Party during the campaign. I saw absolutely no mention of that when the Governor General attended this place and actually gave and actually gave his presentation in relation to the Labor Party's agenda in government. Uh, there was not Scar, you, you've moved on from the point of order, have you? Yes. I can return to your speech. Thank you. I'll, I'll just clarify. I saw, we've, we've moved, the, the caravan moves on. Uh, I saw absolutely no mention, absolutely no mention of electricity price savings for the Australian consumer when the Governor General attended in this place last week for the opening of this parliament and effectively laid down the government's agenda. Absolutely no reference to that $275 electricity price saving. And I will be happy, I will be happy, Senator Urquhart, to come back to that $275 supposed saving that those opposite are going to deliver to Australian electricity users every week this parliament sits between now and the next federal election, because I do not believe that you will deliver that cost saving in this inflationary environment. I don't believe you're going to deliver that cost saving at all. And it'll be fascinating to see. It'll be fascinating to see how the construction costs, which are going to blow out as a result of your policy with abolishing the ABCC, it's going to be very interesting to see how those construction costs, additional construction costs, for every single transmission tower that is built in this country, every single transmission tower built in this country will cost more, approximately 30 per cent more, as a result of your abolishing abolition of the ABCC. That's what's going to happen to electricity costs. That's what's going to happen because those construction costs feed into every single cost across the whole of the Australian economy, including including electricity prices. Because you've got to get the electricity from point A to point B. So when you 
construct your solar panel farm, your wind farm, whatever it is in terms of renewables, you've got to construct the transmission lines. And that's where the construction costs are extraordinarily relevant. And I do not believe, I'll be happy to be corrected at the time, but I do not believe that those opposite will deliver that $275 saving in terms of electricity costs. And we will wait and see. And those including those in the gallery who will be receiving their electricity bills between now and the next election, they can be the judge. They can be the judge. And they should ask themselves before the next election whether or not their electricity prices have actually decreased, have actually decreased by $275. And we'll actually see what happens. And those electricity costs, those electricity costs are affecting every single part of Australian society, not just the retail consumer but also the business consumer. And it also includes small businesses where I have my patch in Queensland. I was speaking to a small business just this week about cost pressures on their small business. And Nick runs a cafe and he's being hit with the cost increases in terms of electricity, in terms of wages, but also but also in terms of rent, small business rent increases, which are which are going to go up, which are going to go up as a direct result of the inflationary impact which is provided for under his lease. And that's what we're facing in this country. That's what we're facing. We're facing increased costs across the board. And in that environment, it is simply not credible, given the government's own plans, that electricity prices will fall by $275. In fact, all the evidence, I believe, will be to the contrary, especially when you consider especially when you consider the cost of transmission and actually getting, providing stability to the electricity grid and getting the renewable energy sources fed into the grid. And that, that $275, Senator Urquhart was keen for me to mention it, and I'm happy to, that $275 guarantee, that promise, I suggest, I suggest that it will haunt those sitting opposite between this day up to the next federal election. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, talk about leading with your chin. This is a really quite extraordinary choice of uh, a matter of public importance for the opposition to propose, isn't it? Because if we think about their record for just the tiniest of moments, and I'm surprised that somebody on their side didn't do that before they submitted this as a, as a topic for discussion, this would be your conclusion. If you were trying, if you set out deliberately to design a scheme to undermine Australia's electricity and energy sectors, you couldn't do it better than what the Liberal National Government did during their time in office. They basically had a three-part recipe for higher electricity prices. First, announce plan after plan after plan after plan. 22 of them, but never implement any of them so that industry has absolutely no idea what is going on and has no real way to plan for the future. And consequently, critical investments are not delivered. Second, stymie, obstruct, disable consideration of climate change by the public service and key regulators, banning the use of the term climate change in key organisations so that Australia's policy development can't properly respond to what every other G20 country has basically accepted to be the key factor driving energy uh, market issues over the long term. And third, and this is the killer, mismanage every energy project that has the misfortune to cross your path, like Snowy Hydro 2.2, which by the time they left office was running 18 months late. The member for Hume's signature project, running 18 months late, not confessed, hidden during the election period. The coalition promised a billion dollars, a billion dollars, which they claimed was going to support 3,800 megawatts of new generation over three years ago. Can anyone tell me how much of that actually was delivered? The answer for those playing along at home is none. Absolutely. No dollars delivered at all in relation to that promise and not one kilowatt of power. Under the previous government, four gigawatts of capacity left the system. 
one gigawatt was created. It is a record of failure, crippling failure. And if the coalition had any self-awareness whatsoever, any situational awareness, they would never talk about energy prices again, let alone put an MPI like this up for debate. Instead, what have they done? They've put forward the man behind this debacle, Mr Taylor, as their putative alternative treasurer. This guy who ran the Australian electricity system into the ground is now being proposed as someone who ought to run the economy. The shamelessness is actually quite incredible. Fresh out of office, the coalition are looking back on the damage caused by their last nine years with wide eyes and a faux innocence, saying the equivalent of who me? Australians know that the coalition significantly diminished Australia's capacity to respond to changes in the energy market. Changes like the ones we've seen over the past few months as a result of international developments. We have been left vulnerable and more exposed to high global gas and coal prices. The miracle is the very many good people and good institutions that survived this campaign of destruction by the former government. But it is households and businesses who have been left to pay the price. Now, our government is doing what we can to clean up the mess that we have inherited from the coalition. And there isn't a quick fix. There are nine years of chaos, nine years of inaction to undo, and the problems run deep. And it's not just electricity, it's the broader energy market. Today, the ACCC report that was released confirms what many Australians already know, that they're paying the price for the crisis in the market that's been left by a decade of division and chaos. We are working to resolve these issues. AEMO released a notice of threat to system security and they're working with the market. Over the medium term, our government is progressing a capacity mechanism with the states and empowering AEMO to buy and store gas supplies. And I welcome the announcement from the Minister for Resources that the government will extend and improve the Australian domestic gas security me mechanism. There is work to do across the entire energy system from generation to distribution. Minister Bowen and the government have helped navigate this tailor-made energy crisis without any load shedding, without any blackouts, getting agreement among state and territory ministers on a way forward for firm for renewables. But a key part in our work going forward is to take a part and to resolve the uncertainty, the mismanagement and the blindness to climate change that has weakened Australia's energy system during the previous term of government. We're not wasting any time. We have already notified the United Nations of our intention to increase our emissions reduction target. And as we've made clear, 43 per cent reduction by 2030 is the minimum that we'd hope to achieve. As we said in the documentation, our aspiration is that the commitments of our industry, states and territories and the Australian people will yield even greater emissions reductions in the coming decade. We scrapped Mr Taylor's dodgy regulation that directed the Renewables Agency to fund fossil fuels, and we've also improved its ability to fund electrification and energy efficiency. We've got moving on the review of the integrity of the carbon offset system, including by appointing Professor Ian Chubb and an esteemed panel to lead that work. We've signed a net zero technology partnership with the United States, which focuses on storage, green hydrogen, and integrating various renewables into the grid. We've brought forward well overdue changes to fuel quality standards from 2027 to 2024. There is so much more to do. It's an ongoing project, but we are determined to show leadership where our predecessors showed none. And we stand by our election commitments and our climate change and energy commitments are no exception. Our plan will create hundreds of thousands of jobs, with five out of six of those to be created in the regions. It will generate $76 billion in investment and it includes modernising Australia's electricity grid through a $20 billion rewiring the nation plan. It includes up to $3 billion to invest in renewables, metals, renewable energy component manufacturing and renewable hydrogen electrolysers. 
It includes 85 solar banks and 400 community batteries across Australia and 10,000 new energy apprenticeships. Most importantly, it will deliver an 82 per cent renewable energy uh, by 2030. That is the modelled outcome of our policies, and it is consistent with AEMO's step change scenario. This will help drive down prices. It will put downward pressure on prices for this very simple reason, a reason denied by the opposition. We know that renewables are the cheapest form of energy and getting cheaper. The CSIRO, CSIRO and the AEMO Gen Cost Report uh, for 2021-22 confirmed that wind and solar are the cheapest source of electricity generation and storage in Australia. It is worth noting that here in the ACT, which is 100 per cent renewable, power prices have actually fallen. More renewables will mean that we are less exposed to changes in fossil fuel prices, like the high global gas and coal prices that have affected Australian energy markets in recent months. Investing in cheaper forms of generating power, like renewables, means that power prices will be lower than they would otherwise have been. There was an opportunity, of course, when the coalition could have talked about electricity prices, and that opportunity was before the election. But what did they do? They didn't want to have the conversation then, did they? No, in fact, what they did was that they intervened to hide the increase to electricity prices accumulated under their watch and to hide it from the Australian people to conceal it until after the election. The Australian Energy Regulator has been required to release its default market offer on 1 May each year since the price safety net was introduced in July 2019. However, fancy this, what a coincidence, just days before the election was called, Mr Taylor signed a regulation that delayed when that default market offer was made public. And when was the new date? The first business day after the 25th of May, after the election. A fig leaf of a reason to allow more consultation, as if this government, the previous government, ever, ever wanted to consult on anything. In some parts of the country, the price increase was 19 per cent. This is what Minister Taylor wanted to hide. I wonder if he shared it with his colleagues. I wonder if he shared it with some of the senators on the other side, because Senator, this government was addicted to secrets. I'll move to Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support Senator Payne's matter of public importance. Prime Minister Albanese's promise to reduce electricity bills $275 and his promise to reduce Australia's carbon dioxide output 43 per cent are mutually exclusive. High energy prices will reduce energy usage and assist Australia to, re to reach the 43 per cent figure. Lower energy prices will increase energy consumption and that will work against the Albanese government's target. That's why the Albanese government so quickly ran away from, it, from his promise. The Prime Minister never intended to honour the promise, making his actions cynical political expediency. One Nation believes any attempt to implement a 43 per cent carbon dioxide reduction is a policy based on lies and distortions which do not stand up to rigorous scrutiny. Prime Minister Albanese has already signalled across several issues his government will be a government based on virtue signalling, not sensible policy. For senators with no data on their side, the only option is to sell a policy on feelings. Feelings will not keep the lights on, supermarket freezes cold or hospitals open. Feelings will not warm Australia in winter or cool us in summer. Evidence-based policy will. Energy deficits in several areas of Australia have already caused blackouts. The 43 per cent target will cause many more blackouts. Rapidly increasing electricity costs will reduce consumption of electricity and buy the government time while it asks around for a permanent solution, which is why the government is allowing this to happen. Closing down and sabotaging baseload coal has led to the national electricity racket, oh, sorry, market, showing unprecedented average wholesale power prices. The average spot price of $264 per megawatt hour last quarter is more than triple the average spot price of $85 per megawatt hour this time last year. Prime Minister Albanese knew this when he made his promise. Now, clearly, economics is not the Prime Minister's strong suit. If the cost of an item is up 300 per cent, the chances of being able to make it cheaper without the government paying for it are zero. Perhaps the Prime Minister can extend his, his employment talk fest to more aspects of government business. Let's see if anyone knows how to use wind and solar to replace baseload coal and save Australia from electricity and energy Armageddon. Because all I'm hearing so far is build more wind and solar. 
Building more will simply add more capacity when we don't need it during the day, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. Solar and wind will need to be paired with some form of battery technology to move that generated electricity from the day when we don't need it to the evening when we do. Coal sitting in, in hoppers, ready to generate power on demand, is the battery we have used successfully for 120 years. Alternatives to coal are thin on the ground. Battery storage costs are, st are staggering and unsustainable $1.5 million per megawatt hour. We need around 60,000 megawatt hours of energy in storage to ensure any 24 hour period is not subject to blackouts. Yet batteries need 20% above rated capacity to achieve full charge due to heat loss which is why they catch fire a lot. This means we need 72,000 megawatt hours of storage at a cost of $108 billion every 12 years. The life of a Tesla II battery, big battery. $9 billion every year. The Snowy II big hydro battery, currently under construction, will provide 1,000 megawatt hours daily for 355 days a year at a cost of $5 billion. This means that pumped hydro will cost $300 billion to carry enough power for just one day. And of course, adding electric vehicle charging to the mix means a whole lot more of blackouts and a whole lot more of electricity price increases. Net zero is an unaffordable fairy tale that will destroy our standard of living and destroy our lifestyle. We are one community, we are one nation, and we know what the hell's needed to get back to affordable, reliable, stable electricity. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australians are hurting. The cost of living is rising through the roof, and we have a government who is refusing to do anything about it. Even worse, we have a government who went, who went to the most recent election with a promise to reduce electricity prices by $275 for households by 2025. However, as the matter for um, as the MPI points out, after only a matter of weeks, they are walking back on their promise. Prime Minister Albanese said he would take responsibility, but all he seems to be doing is blaming others and making personal attacks. The Prime Minister is doing anything but taking responsibility for the energy crisis we are currently facing. And it seems clear from the contributions in the chamber from the other side this is largely because they have no experience in the energy sector whatsoever. At least I can say I've spent 20 years plus in, in the energy sector, on and off, including two stints at AEMO. At so I bring a little bit of knowledge to this matter. The energy crisis is largely due to a number of factors, partly the war in Ukraine, and our capacity for coal-fired power generation being at the lowest level in over a decade. However, we are also facing a gas shortage crisis that has the potential to drive power prices through the roof. As the ACCC report that was released today states, the East Coast gas market is facing a 56 petajoule shortfall in supply in 2023, signifying, and I'm quoting this, and signifying a substantial risk to Australia's energy security. Now, for those of you who don't know a petajoule from your pet pet, this is equivalent to about 10 per cent of next year's forecast demand. And I quote also from the HVLC, the effects of these changes are concentrated in the southern states, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and the Australian Capital Territory, where gas resources have been diminishing for some time. The ACCC report specifically states that to address the projected shortfall of gas in 2023, significant additional volumes of gas will need to be produced. Now, I don't see how the government will be able to stick to the, their promise of reducing power bills if they do not specifically support the additional production of gas. And it is this lack of support that is hurting Australians already with the report highlighting that users are now receiving offers at higher prices with less flexibility. Australia is now paying the price of some incredible mistakes by the Andrews Victorian government. The government's ban on onshore gas exploration 
as well as fracking and coal seam gas exploration, has exacerbated this problem. We only have this supply problem because the Andrews government cut off supply without a thought of how it was going to be replaced. This is a problem entirely of the Andrews government's making, and now at a time when cost of living is increasing. Australians are paying for that incompetence and the lack of, and the, lack of the Albanese government's willingness to do anything about it. Quick history lesson. Victoria has had a long history of cheap, abundant natural gas, one of the strongest gas industries in the world. The Bass Strait uh, oil wells, the gas and oil wells, powered Victoria, turned it into an industrial powerhouse because we had cheap, available gas. Now, with those Bass Strait oil wells drying up and no replacements because of the bans and moratoriums, we are bringing gas down from Queensland paying extra and, more, and expending more energy to transport that via the distribution transmission network. Yet what a lot of people on that side and across the, the chamber seem to forget is that a lot of the gas coming out of Queensland is from coal seam gas, fracked coal seam gas. A little bit of an inconvenient truth there for you maybe, but it's the actual truth. The only way to drive a disconnect between high global gas prices and our domestic East Coast prices is to invest in more supply, which my home state of Victoria has an abundance of but is not being allowed to access. As published by the International Energy Agency recently, the world has experienced the first global energy crisis in history. Now, the 1970s oil crisis, I don't know how they missed that one, but Let's put that to the side. Yes, in a large part, this is because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, it highlights what should be a bleedingly obvious point. There are, and always will be, unexpected events and outcomes. If the last three years has taught us anything, it is that we really, is that we really do not know what the future holds and that we can only be, be prepared for the future by ensuring we are protected against a whole range of scenarios. While they, while they are not responsible for a surge in global prices, this government is responsible for how they respond. Australians expect that this government act to fulfil their promise to the Australian people and lower their power bills. Now, the Labor Party are correct when they state that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. On a plant-based level, when the wind is blowing, the sun is shining, and solar, wind and solar is the cheapest form of generation. However, as signed in JP Morgan's 2020 annual energy paper, putting more renewable energy on the grid will not guarantee lower prices. I repeat, will not lower, uh, guarantee lower prices, because energy prices rest on an average cost of generation, not the actual cost of sustaining a power source that cannot deliver energy on a continuous basis unsupported. The term we use is firmed. <coughs> Pardon me. The report notes that the costs include transmission, backup thermal power, potentially if it ever comes, utility scale um, battery storage. Now none of this will come cheap and ultimately costs will be passed on to the consumer. Whatever fills the intermittent power void will initially be expensive and it most definitely won't be easy. Labor's community batteries for household policy is to fund 400 community batteries of 500 kilowatt hours each, which is supposed to provide power for 250 households. Assuming that the 22 kilowatt hour nightly load would take over 80,000 batteries to meet the power consumption of Melbourne's 1.8 million households. Even if the 400 proposed batteries were all built in Victoria, they would only meet 0.5 of the city's winter nighttime demand. A 500 kilowatt hour battery could provide sufficient power overnight for only 23 households. This is equivalent to needing one on every street, not in each suburb. Snowy 2.0 has a capacity of 350 million kilowatt hours 
capacity to meet Melbourne's nightly demand for over a week. Labor suggests they can source batteries at $500,000 each, which equates to $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Snowy 2.0 costing $4.5 billion for 350 megawatt hours comes out to only $12.90 per kilowatt hour. This $500,000 estimate does not reflect market prices and is unlikely to include costs for installation and maintenance. AEMO's latest integrated system plan released in June states that we are going to have to double electricity by 2050 as we electrify the economy. As coal-fired generation withdraws, and it will and it should, whether dependent generation starts to dominate, investment is needed to treble the firming capacity provided by new low-emission firming alternatives that can respond to a dispatch signal with efficient network investments to access it. Right now, we're seeing the economic risks of mismanagement playing out before our eyes. Despite Labor claiming they conducted the most comp comprehensive ever done uh, uh, in opposition, it is clear that their plan cannot work and will not work. Europe serves as a good example. They severely miscalculated by reducing production of fossil fuels faster and is now caught off guard and suffering at the hands of Russia due to their energy reliance. We should not make the same mistake. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to thank Senator Payne for this opportunity, for giving this chamber the chance to talk about the Albanese government's comprehensively modelled and thoroughly developed Powering Australia plan. I invite members to have a look at that plan and the modelling rather than throw around baseless um, emotive accusations. I want to thank Senator Payne because I welcome any opportunity to talk about the Labor government's plan to create 604,000 jobs, five out of every six which will be delivered in the region. I welcome any opportunity to talk about the $56 billion in investment that will be spurred by this plan. And I welcome any opportunity to outline our plan to deliver 82 per cent renewables by 2030. That means $20 billion to modernise our ageing electricity grid. It means $3 billion to invest in renewable metals and energy component manufacturing. It means 85 new solar banks and it means 400 community batteries across the country. Program. Now we've heard a lot of debate in this chamber um, over the last couple of hours about this. And a lot of the argument that I have heard disconnects a range of the policies and looks at them in isolation. The utilisation of renewable energy requires the upgrade in the grid. So no, to those opposite, the investment in modernising our grid is not a waste. It is not fruitless. It is actually the sensible plan that should have started long ago to make sure that the cheapest power that we can possibly get in this country is delivered in the most efficient way. And that is exactly what an Albanese Labor government is going to do. We have laid out the plans, and that is what we are going to deliver. And that is what will impact those energy prices and the bills that Australians are paying across the country. These are the plans that will make a fundamental difference. Now, I have no doubt that the Chamber and the Australian people would have liked to have known a range of things before the election. Obviously the outcome is that we are in government on this side of the Chamber, but I believe the clarity and honesty should have been there. There were a range of things that were hidden from the public in the lead-up to the election, 
and the manner in which they, could they were done can only be seen as a political stunt to hide information. We know that there were price rises that were well and truly locked in, but the minister decided not to advise the Australian people of that. The minister decided to hide that information, and that information would have told small businesses in New South Wales that their energy prices were about to go up by 19.7 per cent, while at the same time saying that they are the ones looking after business. I don't think that really can be true. And in my own home state of South Australia, domestic household bills were projected to go up by 7.2 per cent. Well, of course they weren't going to tell anyone that. And if you're a Tasmanian, they were going to go up by 11.8 per cent. So it seems quite obvious that that stunt was purely and utterly political. This is information that is released every year at the same time, apart from this year when the previous government hid it. And when we start talking about gas, the former energy minister had promised a gas-led recovery. What we've actually seen is industry and the community left vulnerable as we've faced a global gas crisis. We've seen the lack of a clear policy framework stifle investment and prevent cheaper renewables that could have filled that gap as we are facing this crisis. When senators opposite talk about energy security and prices, I think the Australian people know not to take them seriously. They know that they are using this as a political plaything. They knew that their signature energy policy, Snowy 2.0, was running 18 months late. They never mentioned that either. They knew that when the former government proposed $1 billion to support 3,800 megawatts of new generation, that come the election, not one single dollar and not one single kilowatt would have been delivered. The Australian people knew not to trust those opposite to maturely provide policy certainty to the Australian community. They trusted us. They trusted an Anthony Albanese Labor government. They trusted us because we have got a plan. And as the senator opposite's motion indicates, it is a comprehensively modelled plan, well pointed out. And it is a plan that can be delivered. It's a plan that will ensure that the renewable energy future is very, very bright. We know renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. This has been proven by CSIRO, AEMO and numerous other sources. It is the cheapest form of energy, and it is the form of energy that we should pursue. I'm proud to be a South Australian and to have seen the significant leadership in our state with a new Labor government in, their, in, in South Australia. And they have shown the renewable sector to be a prominent piece in their plan. The opportunity presented now by the joint work of an Albanese federal government and the Malinowskis state government is so exciting, and we're already, to, we're already starting to see that gap being filled and the hope in our community and in business that the policy malaise is in the past. I know that regional communities see their future in the renewables industry. Investment in solar, wind, grid-scale grid battery technology and, notably for South Australia, hydrogen means that those regional communities have a pathway to lead us out of the uncertainty that has plagued us for years. The excitement that I see when I travel to towns like Wyala and Port Augusta is palpable. They can see what the opportunities are here. They can see that it's real, and they can see that we can deliver on it. The excitement will be underpinned by a very sensible, mature policy approach from the federal and the state government that will actually look at energy that is stable and affordable and will help boost the industry developments that are planned for those regions and in broader regions across Australia. But we know there's no quick fix, 
and we are taking the short-term and the long-term steps necessary to ensure that we do not again end up where we have been for the last long nine obfuscating years. We have taken the short-term steps necessary to stabilise our gas market. AEMO has taken steps to work with the market using mechanisms available to ensure gas supply is shifted appropriately between the states to meet demand. The Minister for Resources has announced that the government will improve and extend the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, and as well as progressing a capacity mechanism within the states. Long term, we have embarked on the policy agenda I outlined earlier, our Powering Australia policy, one that we are all very, very proud of. It is a policy that means the generations that come after us can be confident that we have a secure energy grid, that we have secure plans that are not going to threaten our environment, a policy that makes sure that families, small business and industry can keep the lights on and keep the manufacturing plants running without breaking the bank. A policy that means jobs, particularly in regional communities, that define our community's character will flourish into the future. And that is what Labor brought to the election, and that is what the Australian people wanted. So I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and talk about this matter of extreme public importance and talk to you about the Powering Australia plan that will deliver. It will deliver stable, reliable, affordable electricity into the future. Senator Pocock, are you seeking the call? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech. I rise today to speak about the need to reduce electricity prices. High and ever-rising prices contribute to the significant cost of living pressures that are being felt by people across the country. I would like to talk about the solutions. Renewable energy and electrification. These solutions are right in front of us. Across the ACT, households are enjoying the benefits of the clean energy transition. While electric electricity prices soar across Australia, they are falling. Yes, falling by more than 5 per cent when you account for inflation here in the ACT. The ACT is the only jurisdiction in which, in which prices are falling. Prices that are already cheaper than most places across mainland Australia. Just across the border in New South Wales, households pay as much as $800 more on electricity each year. This saving is just the start, with further and more significant savings to be had as households start to enjoy the benefits of electrification. These benefits are set out in a proposal I put forward for a Suburb Zero pilot. Under that two-year pilot, participating households would be fully electrified. EVs, rooftop solar, battery storage, storage, all electric appliances and heat pumps. All of these technologies exist and are available off the shelf today. Modelling by Rewiring Australia shows that electrification would save participating Canberra households more than $5,000 each year. $5,000 every year. This will put downward pressure on electric prices and deliver real savings for households. And just as household electrification reduces cost of living pressures, it will also put downward pressure on inflation. We have heard a lot about inflation recently on the news and indeed here in this, in this chamber. A clear way to ease inflationary pressures is to reduce the cost of electricity prices, particularly to residential customers. This has been recognised by the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States which commits some $369 billion of investment in clean energy to reduce the inflation caused by reliance on fossil fuels. The economic argument for renewable energy and electrification is clear. Electrifying our households is a capital investment in the future, like buying a mortgage or an education. Businesses should be given confidence to invest in renewable energy and electrification should be incentivised for consumer uptake. I'm proud to represent a community that has seen the opportunities and been a leader on some of the opportunities the clean energy transition presents, with us, presents us with, but we still have a long way to go. 
and I want to work with everyone in this place to maximise the benefits for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make some remarks about this matter of public importance. Now, it was a big mistake that the Labor Party decided that it would promise to make a particular saving on people's electricity bills, because, of course, uh, in this country it is the market that is going to be funding the transition. Well, that's what we want to happen, uh, not the government. So without knowing how much capital the uh, country was going to be able to attract, it was always going to be quite a fraught calculation. Now, of course, the reality is that this whole area of public policy has been a real nightmare for the country over the last 10 years. Uh, there has been too much politics, and that has hurt the country. Now, this is another example where a cheap, glib political attempt uh, is going to unravel and damage the argument. Because, of course, the promise that uh, was made by the Labor Party before the last election will not be delivered in this parliament. Uh, it won't be delivered in the, in the short term um, because of the reason I just gave you, that the government has no idea how much private capital the country will be able to attract to fund the transition. Now, anyone who's read the AEMO reports knows that this transition is going to cost an absolute bomb. So um, this is a government that has already broken one promise on this issue. But of course, the promises that it has delivered, it has delivered on behalf of its owners, its parent companies, the union movement and the super funds. It has already delivered on its promise to abolish the ABCC and it has already delivered on its promise to hide the superannuation funds donations to the Labor Party and to the union movement. So it is a government for vested interests, delivering for the union movement, delivering for the super funds and of course breaking promises that they made to Australians. Now on the matter of emissions reduction, which is a, a, a matter of uh, great national importance, uh, what is important is the outcome. It is the outcome that is important, not the embroidery. And of course, one of the key outcomes we're seeking here as a country in a race for global capital is capital. We want the capital, and so we need to evaluate and make a judgment about what is going to be the best way to get that capital. Now, one of the ways to not get the capital is to engage in cheap, juvenile, uh, glib promises that you break only a few weeks after the election because, of course, you don't know what's going to happen in global markets. You don't know how the country will get the capital. And so uh, Mr Bowen, who's the minister, has said about the legislation that he introduced last week, uh, I have repeatedly said that we have designed our Powering Australia plan so that it can be implemented whether the legislation passes or not. So um, apparently the legislation is a, is a maybe, is it could be something that's important, maybe not be. Don't know. We don't know yet. We'll see, um, we'll see how, um, how that goes. Uh, but what is very important and what is most important to me is that we get the country on the medium to long term plan for having an accelerated emissions reduction. Uh, because the 26 to 28 position uh, is not a credible position. Uh, it needs to be higher than that. Uh, and so what we need to do is to try and find some sort of a accommodation where we are sending the right signal to the rest of the world that we are committed to emissions reduction and we're committed to enhancing our position over the, over the long term. But in the short term, this matter of public importance is about a broken promise. It is about a broken promise to the Australian people uh, that their bills will be cut in the short term, uh, whereas in fact their bills will go up. Now, that is very regrettable when you consider that the promises that have been delivered in full for the donors and the owners of the Labor Party at the unions and the super funds have been delivered in full. The Labor Party has already gutted the Your Super, Your Future reforms. The Labor Party has already gutted and abolished in uh, some form the ABCC, and it said that if it can't abolish it in law, it will just defund it. So it will go around the democratic process. So uh, if you are a person in Australia, uh, you are not likely to have your election commitment fulfilled. But if you are a donor or if you are an owner of the Labor Party, 
if you are a trade union or you're, you're a super fund, you will have your promises delivered in full. Thank you, Senator Bragg. The time for the discussion has expired, and I shall now be.